Um, we have, if you are new to us this morning, you will find a card either in the pew or you were handed one when you came in. Please connect with us. Please fill this out and you can give it to one of the pastors. You can put it in the offering. You can uh, give it to somebody who has a connector sign on them. Even if you're not new to us, grab one of these if you would like to put in a prayer request. If you'd like to sign up for the newsletter and you haven't been receiving the newsletter, that as well. Connect, grow, serve. You'll see those words a lot around this church, and you will hear those words a lot around this church. That is what we as a body of Christ plan to do. Connect. Connect with Jesus Christ. Connect with one another. Did you catch the symbolism of that? Connect with Jesus Christ. Connect with one another. And that is the cross. That's why we're here, because of what Christ did on the cross for us. We have a few announcements this morning, but first I want to highlight something. Last Sunday, even though it was chilly, it was sunny, and we had Easter at the farm. Many of you were there to help. What spoke to me the most during that was that there, it was an intergenerational event. We had our older people helping. We had younger people helping. We had Hannah, Laura, and Michelle, and Diane, um, who else? Um, Minnie Campbell, helping our little ones with crafts. We had Marie and Buddy Price making sure that the kids who went down the inflatables went down safely and they were good. I didn't see them going down it, though. You guys didn't do that, right? I didn't either. But you made it possible, just like I said last Sunday, you make these things possible because of your generosity, your gifts, your, not only your gifts of time and talent, but your gifts of, of money that help support the ministries of this church. I also want to point out Judy Bailey and Caroline Hudson. Raise your hands over there, ladies. These two ladies were bus drivers last week and took a group to the Billy Graham Library. Thank you for doing that. Now, while they put the pedal to the, uh, the pedal to the metal, you make it possible. By your support of this church, you make sure those buses are maintained, you make sure we have gasoline to take people on these trips, and that is a beautiful thing. Yesterday, the church was open for Ryan Ledbetter's Eagle Scout program. It says in the bulletin today, but it was yesterday afternoon, so don't come this afternoon. And that was, again, this church opened its doors and allowed that. Ryan finished his Eagle Scout project by building raised, bre raised beds at the daycare center. Thank you. All these things are made possible by your gifts, by your generosity to this church. What else do we have? Ed Garrison reached out to me on Friday and said thank you to everyone who has taken the time to send him a card to inquire about his, how he's doing. He's doing better. He can't drive yet. <clears throat> he's waiting to be released by the doctor this week for driving. He put all of his cards out in display, and he said, somebody said to him, I never realized you had that many friends. <laughs> and many of those friends are from Trinity. Thank you. We have... Vacation Bible School coming up. And again, we need your help. We need your generosity of your time, your talents, and your gifts. If you are interested in that, please see the, the announcement in the bulletin about VBS and reach out so that we can, again, have an intergenerational type experience with older and younger and everybody together. Tonight, The Wounded Healers is starting a new series we're using the book called The Grief Club. You know, The Grief Club is a club that nobody asks to be part of. But for those of you who think that it is only a group that meets because of losses by death, it's not the case. We are a warm, inviting, non-judgmental group of people. And whether your loss is due to a relationship, a friendship, a job, perhaps losing a home, losing a beloved pet, no matter what the loss is, 
you are invited to come and be part of that. I would ask this morning that you check your bulletin for other announcements that pertain to you. And if you have any questions, just ask after the service. Also, um, take care uh, to look at the prayer requests that are in the bulletin. There are many people who need your prayers and my prayers. This time, I would ask Alice Farr, who is the chair of the SPRC, to come up with an announcement for the congregation. Good morning, Trinity. Um, this time of year is always a little uh, tough on us Methodists. It's the time that the cabinet meets to decide uh, on pastoral appointments. We're a little bit late in the process at this point. Um, but uh, some congregations get great news. Others don't. I got a call uh, on Thursday afternoon from the district superintendent, Fran Elrod, to let me know that... Uh, the bishop has decided to uh, reappoint Carson Bryant, our associate, uh, because he is needed in another church. And so his skills and his uh, experience will lend very well to that. Uh, again, we're late in the process, so it was a surprise to all of us. Uh, it was a surprise to me. It was a surprise to Scott. It was a surprise to Carson. Uh, that's not a move that we asked for. Matter of fact, we adamantly uh, asked that we not have this move. Um, it's not a move that Carson asked for, but the bishop, um, and it was a need at the church. So Carson will uh, be serving starting in July at Lake City United Methodist Church as lead pastor. So as much as we grieve his loss and are disappointed in that loss, we're excited for him and his ministry that he will be able to take to, to Lake City. And so um, I just wanted to, to announce that to you. Uh, Carson, do you, would you like to say a few words? Yeah. Um... Like Ella said, this wasn't something we were looking for or asking for, um, but within our system, um, when the bishop says, you have to go. That's just kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thank you so much. You know, this isn't my last day, as Ellis was saying. I'll be here through June. Um, but I want to go ahead and thank you so much for all of the ways that you have loved me, um, loved my family, to make Trinity just a phenomenal first appointment these past, well, it, it'll be two years by the time I leave. Um, well, you know, and this is how it goes, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, when I met with Fran and to talk about the change and everything, what she said was, there aren't a whole lot of churches like Trinity. Like, this is a really good one. Um, and it's a, I'm thankful to have had a first appointment that's about as good as it gets. So thank you all um, for all the ways that you have loved me into ministry and supported me and cared for me and my family. Um, and I would appreciate your prayers in this time of transition. Thanks. I guess that means you are being ordained. Yeah, yeah, that was already approved. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> That's a given. So uh, as Carson said, his ministry, even though we're making this announcement today, his ministry at Trinity does not stop today. He will be uh, with us through June. He will support us, and we will support him in, in, in the ministry here. Uh, at, at the annual conference where these appointments will be fixed at that time, uh, he will have uh, ordination. We will support him through that ordination uh, in June. Um, and so, as I said, his ministry doesn't stop today. Um, speaking of the district superintendent, Fran, Fran was uh, Fran didn't ask for this either. So <laughs> this is not something that she uh, wanted and fought uh, very hard to keep Carson here. However, in this transition, she's looking out for Trinity. So we will have a new associate appointed in July. Uh, that will be Minjin Gossard. I've got that right this time. Um, she is currently the uh, lead pastor at, uh, or head pastor at uh, Rehoboth United Methodist Church. So she comes to us not only with experience as a, an associate, but also as a uh, lead pastor at, at a congregation. She was uh, ordained full elder in 2017. So we will get that experience not only as an associate, but also uh, as a lead pastor. And so that will uh, be a, a very good fit, we believe, here at Trinity. So, Scott, do you want to say a few things about Minjin? Yeah, so Minjin was uh, first served at Littleton Street in Camden as an associate for a number of years and now has been at Rehoboth for a couple of years. I've been unofficially mentoring her for other reasons unknown, so now you quickly see how God works in mysterious ways that now she's going to be appointed here as an associate. So we already know each other. She's a full elder. She's ready to go, just like Carson was 
you know, is ready to go for his appointment. She's going to be ready to go when she comes in here. So there'll be no drop off in what you see. We're just going to keep going. Um, she's very talented. Um, as we say goodbye, we'll also say hello to Mijin. And again, that's how the system works. Uh, we thank Fran for uh, looking after us. This is a good appointment. Uh, this is going to be good for Carson. This is going to be good for Mijin. Even if we don't believe that right now, we do know that it will be in the long run. And so uh, if anybody has any questions about that, please give me a call. Always available questions, concerns, or anything else. Scott, you want to have a prayer yeah, as we move I'll forward? Yeah, pray. Let us pray. Oh, most gracious God, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the gift of life and the life that Karsten and Christine and the boys have brought to Trinity, though ministry continues here for still a few more months. We thank you for the ways that you have used Karsten, spoken through him, used his hands and feet to show us Christ. And as he goes, we, we are sad and disappointed, but we celebrate as he will be ordained and move on to make the decisions that are best for his new flock in Lake City. We pray for them in this transition. We also play, pray as Mijin comes forward, as she says goodbye to Rehoboth, and we say hello to Mijin and welcome her in to all the good things that are happening here at Trinity. We know, O oh Lord, we do not know and understand. We have unanswered questions. But if we just keep our hearts open, you will show us, you will speak to us. Now be with us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so grateful to be connected in Jesus' name for worship this morning. We are happy to have both online and in-person participants today. Would you please stand if you're able for the responsive reading? It can be found in the bulletin or on the overhead screen. Your part is in bold. Coming from places that have seen better days, God forbids us to celebrate this day, a day full of new possibilities, coming with our breath taken away by grief. The Holy Spirit breathes new life within us, renewing our connection with God and with one another, coming to worship seeking a hope that will endure. Christ unbinds the fetters that hold us in death, speaking in word and sacrament and building community for holy service. Our gathering hymn is Lord of the Dance, page 261 in your hymnal. And it can, I think it can be on the screen too.
be seated. Please join me in the prayer for illumination in your bulletin or on the screen. Let us pray. Come us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we might feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your resurrection witnesses. Amen. Our Psalter reading is Psalm 130, which is also printed in your bulletin and on the screen. And we will read this responsively. And again, your part is in bold. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, with the Lord is plenteous redemption. <clears throat> Our second reading is from Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. You may read along from the screen, your bulletin, or your Bible. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out, of, out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you, with, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O my people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people." I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. May God bless us as we apply these words to our lives.
awake? Barely? I know. It's, a, it's definitely a two cup of coffee day. So, what is this? That's a bottle of water. Actually, in the Old Testament, David asked God to put his tears in a bottle to keep them, to remind him that even though there are sad times, there can be happy times too. Now, this bottle's only half full, and I can assure you I have cried way more many tears than this in my life when things make me sad or when I'm hurt. So raise your hand if you've ever fallen down and scraped your knee or your elbow or something and it hurt and it made you cry. Yeah, and all you adults out there, I know you've done this too. Or what about if someone said something that really hurt your feelings and that made you cry? Okay. And what about if a friend of yours was really sad and because they were hurting, you were sad too and you cried? Everybody, right? Well, in the story we're going to hear today in the Bible, Jesus' friend Lazarus had gotten sick. And Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, had sent word to Jesus that he was sick. And before Jesus could get there, Lazarus died. And when Jesus got there and, and saw Mary and Martha and they were crying, you know what? Jesus cried too. He did. And then, though, Jesus said, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to show God to others. And he went up to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked out. And then those tears of sadness turned to tears of joy. So what we need to remember today is that even though David asked God to put his tears in this bottle, there's a little bit later on in the Bible, it says God will wipe away every tear and we need to remember that Jesus knows when we're sad because he's been sad too but he will help us wipe away those tears so we can find joy another day all right let us pray and repeat after me dear God we thank you for the tears and also for the joy that follows Thank you for understanding us and for always being with us through the tears and in the joy. Amen. Okay, if you're going to children's church, you go that way or you go that. Thank you. So it is good to see you today on this rainy, stormy day. Of all the places you could be, you're at Trinity United Methodist Church in Blythewood. We're a church that connects and grows and serves. We connect with one another and God to grow into the people that we're called to be so that we might serve boldly with love and grace. That is who we are at Trinity. Now, today, I'm going to let you know you might get in touch with a place that may or may not feel comfortable for you today. Um, I, I will challenge us to get to a place that might be very hard for us to be. Uh, so as we get to that place, however you need to, you know, if, if all of a sudden you've got tears in your eyes, don't be afraid. It's okay, because we're going to get to some place on the other side of that shortly. This week's title of my sermon is Disappointment and Unanswered Questions. That title came before Wednesday of this week when I got the phone call from the district superintendent. So the, I'm, I'm going to get you. This, this sermon is really meant for us today. Right? So it came, Wednesday came, and I received a call. I looked at my phone, and I saw it was the district superintendent. And I said, hello, how are you? And she goes, I'm going to be okay. I want you to be okay. 
And I'm like, oh boy, what's coming? And she proceeds to tell me that Carson's name had come up to be on the move list to move to Lake City. And then she goes, and first thing in my mind is, you're not moving me, are you? And she was like, I didn't say that out loud. I thought it to myself. And then she goes ahead and talks to me about Mejian coming as associate. And would that be okay? And I said, great. So all of that happened on Wednesday of this week. Then, of course, Ellis Staff Parish found out on Thursday. You don't know what a relief it is to be able to say all that out loud to you. Trying to hold that for a couple of days is awful. Like, right, Karsten? I mean, it's awful. <laughs> we played golf together on Friday and just tried to, I mean, we just tried to do some things to kind of get all of that out of our mind. Because there is great disappointment. There is disappointment from me, from Karsten. You are feeling the disappointment. And it's hard for us to get through that. And we've had a couple of days to get through, and we're still working through it. But you hearing that, it, it jolts us all of a sudden. What has happened? What has happened? Well, good, goodness gracious for Lazarus and the story of him coming out of the grave, Jesus bringing him back to life, because that's going to help us work through this transition and work through where you might be in your own life with your disappointments uh, as I told you a couple weeks ago, these are the long pieces of John we're going through. So this is another long piece of scripture. You can remain seated as I read this story about Lazarus. But listen, listen to this story and see how this might help us understand our own disappointment and unanswered questions. This is from John 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? He answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. He said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? 
And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. But Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lazarus is dead, Jesus tells his disciples. Hear those words with the Lazarus in your life. Right? Those are hard words to hear. Your loved one has died. Lazarus is dead. Imagine the questions that are running through the disciples' minds. Remi imagine what they're asking. They're the same kind of questions that I've been asking or I've heard asked when those unexpected deaths and funerals interrupt our lives. I've seen it in ministry over and over and over again. It interrupts. It's a disappointment. It's a grief that happens. And they're the same kind of questions we ask when our lives are interrupted. Right? When something has changed and we just don't understand. It's not the way that we want it. It's not the way that we expected it to be. Right? We don't expect these things. We, we typically might ask, why? How could this happen? What's next for me? Is this an ending or a beginning? Could it be both? How do I move forward from this? How do I make sense of what has happened? What will life be like now? Why didn't it work out the way I wanted? What could or should I have done differently? Is there life after this? Why didn't God do something? Right? You have other questions. You could easily give your examples of what you have questioned in your disappointment. That list could get longer and longer and longer. It is a disappointment today that we in this congregation can feel on one level. With news heard earlier about Karsten leaving, about Mijin coming, about all the transition, that is a total disappointment. I mean, it hits you right in the gut. And that's how I felt. It's how Karsten has felt. And it's just like, what, what happened? Why are these things happening? But if we listen and remember the Ezekiel text from Ezekiel 37, the ultimate question, the, the one that lies behind all the questions that we ask, comes in verse 3, where God asks Ezekiel, Mortal, can these bones live? Can these bones live? That's what we're really asking. That's what we're really asking when the Lazaruses of our life, the disappointments, the grief, we're really asking, can these bones live? Now, we may not know that that's what we're asking. That's the root of these things. I want to know. I want to have these questions answered, but they're unanswered questions. We won't ever get these answers here, right? We keep asking them over and over and over and over again. So what is the valley that cuts through the center of your life right now, where there are dry bones all around, where there's disappointment that just guts you? You don't, you don't think that these bones that are on the ground of disappointment can ever rise again. You can't ever get yourself back up off the floor. What questions did you ask when the Lazarus of your life died? 
right? What were those questions that you're asking today? Right? That's a tough place to be. We've all been there and we're all there. Every time life sets before me those kinds of questions, I'm reminded once again that I live with more questions than answers. We have more questions than can ever be answered in our life. We want to know things because we want to know how it affects us, the way that we see it today, the way that we expect it to be tomorrow. But that's not how life comes at us. The answers I do have no longer seem to carry the weight and the authority that they once did because I've learned that life's going to throw these at you. That, that life's going to be filled with unanswered questions. Especially being able to walk with people in their, in their grief. When a loved one is dying or has died and you walk with them, right? And you see, I, I can't answer the questions. Pastor, why did this happen? Right? I, I don't more have an answer than you do. They're unanswered questions. My, my experience has taught me that unanswered questions leave us disappointed. We have a disappointment in life itself, in ourselves, in another, or sometimes in God. We want things to be the way that we think that they should be and not something else. It can't be that way. This is how it has to be. But that's not how God works. And y'all know that's not how life works. It doesn't work that way. Disappointment is wrapped up and bound by our unmet expectations. We expect things to be this way, but they don't always work out for us. It just is, is the, the way that it is. Would, would I like for Carson to stay longer? Absolutely. Right? I would love for him and Christine and the boys. But that's not in the cards for us. However, on the flip side of that, there's a new opportunity for him and a new opportunity for us. Right. This is not a death, but it is a disappointment. Death is different, right? Because they're not coming out of the grave like Lazarus did in this side of the earth, this side of heaven, right? They're not, that's not, that's not, but there is something else happening. But we are disappointed. It's wrapped up and bound by our unmet expectations in life. That's where Mary and Martha are, right? They, they said, hey, we got the teacher. We got Jesus as our, our friend. We know who he is. He can help us here. He can, he can do all things. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right? You, ever, you ever ask yourself that question when you read this scripture and go, man, Jesus, you could have done that. You could have walked up and gone, boom, boom, up, and, up out of the grave. Up out of the bed, boom, done. Because he does it other places. Why not here? Why does that not happen? Even the crowd, <coughs> excuse me, ask, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Even the crowd knew this. We would know this about Jesus. Why don't you do this? You haven't answered any of our questions and you've left us with disappointment and those unanswered questions that we don't even know what you're doing, Jesus. We don't even know. We want answers and explanations and understanding. Now, Jesus doesn't offer answers or, or understanding or, or explanations to Mary and Martha, and he doesn't offer them to us. But there's a good reason why he doesn't, right? He, he doesn't offer that. He uses our disappointment as an agency of transformation, right? We are transformed in those moments. You're not the same person that you are today than you were when your Lazarus, your loved one, was alive or before you knew about the disappointment. You're not. I'm not. We're, we're transformed into who we're called to be. It's just not what we thought it would be, right? It's not how we would have written it down, right? Jesus seems to know that disappointment is inescapable, but it's necessary to a faithful response to all the circumstances in our life because it opens us up to him. Mary and Martha shared their disappointment with Jesus, 
but he didn't give him an answer. He didn't explain it. He just said, okay, and went about his business to show the power and might of who God is. Mary and Martha's words of disappointment are honest and heartfelt, right? I know you've yelled at God before. I've certainly yelled at God before. I've certainly just said, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are we going through this? This is just not even fair. But God doesn't, you don't hear anything. Right? He, doesn't, he doesn't come back and go, hey, it's because of this. Typically, we experience it, right? You experience how your life has shifted, right? We might want to escape our disappointments, but life wants to use them. Our disappointments become something greater. They actually can become an asset for us because we open ourselves up to something different. Like for me, with my nephew who died a couple years ago and the fentanyl use that he used, it actually opens up a door that I never would have walked through to say, man, we got to get that stuff off the streets. I wouldn't have fought like that. Now that my nephew has died, it's like that's not, that stuff can't be around anymore. Or if it is, it's got to be used in a proper way, not the way that it's being used, right? So you, you feel that too in your transformation. So how are you transformed? Just like Lazarus was transformed. Now, he's not resurrected. We're not using that word. Only one was resurrected. That's Jesus, right? This isn't a resurrection because Lazarus dies later, right? But he's tra- there's a transformation that is happening here. The great question before us is whether we experience our disappointment as an opportunity or we experience it as a wound. Is this an opportunity or a wound for us? Now, there's moments that we can let it be a wound, right? We're in grief. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? We get lost in that. But in the end, I pray that it's an opportunity that can rise above. And we can't do that by ourselves. That's why we have counselors. We have clergy. We have church community. You have your other friends. You have other things that you do, activities that bring you joy and life, right, that help lift us out. But we can't come out of that by ourselves, right? It just doesn't happen that way. It takes, it takes more than that. And if, and, and if you go to Christ, he's, he's there and you can listen, but it takes others. He's speaking through others, right? He, he helps us through. Counseling is a great thing. We've got a great counseling center, Don Hilliard, and the other counselors there do a great job. Maybe you have someone that you talk with. The grief group is a fantastic group where we go and, and you learn and you, 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 you embrace. You embrace your own grief and disappointment, which hurts. But when you grab it, you can say, you don't have control over me, but it's there, right? It doesn't, it doesn't control you. You can grab it and you can say, uh-uh, you don't control me, but it still hurts and it's still there, right? But it takes people to help you get to that point. So let me ask you again, what's the valley that cuts through the center of your life with the dry bones of disappointment around you? What is that valley? Whatever it is, it's a place that Jesus has walked, And he has shown us the way. He's been able to lead Mary and Martha and all the folks. He brought Lazarus, came out of the grave, unbind him. He is the transformation of what God can do in our lives in the midst of our disappointments. So in this valley, the question mark of life becomes God's exclamation point. Right? The questions we may have in the end become God's exclamation point, the point, exclamation point of love, of life and light, of mercy and forgiveness, of wisdom and beauty and generosity and hope and healing and compassion and openly and honestly the final yes to you and your life. Yes. So mortal, can these bones live again? You bet your bottom dollar they can. Because that's why we're here, right? That's why we come. That's why in two weeks we're going to celebrate the resurrection, right? Because we believe that that can happen. We believe that those things are true. Even in the midst of our disappointment, we believe when we say that we're going to crucify Jesus the following week, we are praising his name. 
Mortal can these bones live again. Yes, they can. Yes, they do. And yes, they will. So, so wherever this disappointment in your life is, I hope that when you find a moment to let it settle, you can see these things as opportunities. Now, the death of a loved one is much harder than the disappointment of some things we've heard in the room today. I'm aware of that. But it does take us together. It takes someone to walk with you to help you through that. But it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be who God's called you to be. So God's going to put some flesh and breathe life into your bones of disappointment. And they're going to come to life and they're going to praise God. Mortal, can these bones live again? Yes. 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 Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here today to worship you, to hear your word to us, to bring our disappointments to bear. Almighty God, we are disappointed in so many ways, for we have visions and hopes. We have dreams of how things are going to work out. But for those of us who've lived long enough, we know that, that life just doesn't always work in that way. But, but new opportunities come out of our disappointments. God, I think if we were able to look back, we would see how some of the disappointments of our past have led to where we are today. In a very profound way, our lives are changed and different. And those around us are changed and different. Lord, I pray that if we're going through times of grief and trouble, that we would seek help. We would seek help, for guidance to walk with us through these moments because they just don't go away on their own without some, somebody or others walking next to us. Lord, we thank you for this church. As it's going to go through a transition, we know, oh God, that your hand is upon this place that you are working in ways that, that for some of us, we, we are just in awe of what is happening. We pray that we might have eyes to see and our heart open to experience. We pray for Carson and Christine and the boys as they go with a new opportunity to greet and to, to lead people in Lake City, an opportunity that no one asked for, but now is on the table. And we pray, oh God, that that opportunity will lead to something joyous and grand, better than anything we could imagine. And as Mijin comes to us, that as she comes to, to, to work alongside myself and all of us, that she can then continue forward with us as Trinity as we go, not again as how we had drawn it up, but we leave it to you, God, to show us all the possibilities that might come from that. And for all the other disappointments in our lives, oh Lord, you know each person's heart in this room. Some have disappointments of loved ones who are in the hospital, friends or family who are recovering from illness and ailment, from those who have lost loved ones, and yet those loved ones have past years ago, the pain is still there. We know, oh God, that you are the Lord of the dance, that your word is a balm to our pain and disappointment, that you will cover us with your love and your grace and bring people into our lives so that we might walk together on this journey together. Now prepare our hearts and minds as we prepare to come to the table to receive your body and your blood, another opportunity for a gift of grace for each and every one of us. We thank you for this day and this time together. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So now it is our opportunity to profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I'll have us stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We get many opportunities to to serve God uh, by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And our gifts are important to us in ministry as we continue to do things like Easter at the Farm and VBS and some other ministries that are going on, the group that went up to the Billy Graham Museum. I know y'all had a great time. I've heard some wonderful stories about that. And so I I think that as we, we think about and we pray about and experience how God is using us, that we ourselves will give those blessings back to God. God, now it's our time to give back with our tithes and offerings. God, we give these gifts back to you and pray that you will multiply them in our presence. May these gifts lead to a new opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare our hearts and minds to receive this gift today, let us be mindful 
of the opportunities that are before us, we see before us bread and there's juice. But there's more than that here, for it is an opportunity for all of us to receive today. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for forty days and forty nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still small voice. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles for forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. In this we are made one. And this cup from which we drink is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite our servers to come forward. We serve in communion this morning by intention, taking a piece of the bread and dipping it into the cup. We also have gluten-free elements available for intention, as well as prepackaged elements, some of which are gluten-free. The table is set. Come and eat.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Lord, by your body and blood we are fed. By your body and blood we are saved. By your body and blood we are sent into the world to be ministers of the gospel. The gospel being the good news that even death does not have the final word on us. That in the midst of grief and trials and tribulations, in the midst of transitions, Lord, that you are working transformation for our good, for your glory, and for the good of this world. Lord, we thank you for this. Help us to be ever mindful of your grace. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is Breathe on Me, Breath of God, number 420. as we go from this place and into our world, we will have disappointments on the journey. But we pray that God will breathe on us that we shall never die, that we might live with him in eternity. Go in peace to love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this day and always. Amen.